Good morning. Today we resume at uh, Psalm 38. And from Psalm 38 to 41, uh, this record, uh, the, the, the writings of the psalmist, uh, in particular David, I mean, a, a period when he was sick, this was not written or recorded in any scripture prior. But as we studied 38, 39, 40, 41, it was a period when David was unwell, even close to death, and how he sought the Lord. And with uh, the end of 41, we will actually end the first section of the book of Psalms, and that is the Genesis section. So let's uh, start with Psalm 38. So Father, we thank you for another glorious week. A week where your hand was upon us, you saw us through, you helped us, you directed our steps, your mercy and your grace was evident even in our lives. And so Lord, this morning once again, we want to just sit at the feet of your throne, at the foot of your throne, and we just want to uh, digest everything, Lord, that you have in store for us. So bless us as we proceed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this Psalm 38, title, Forgive My Sin. And this is the third of the seven penitential psalms. If you have been following us, I've given you all the numbers. You look, just look back at the previous slides. Uh, it is a lament. It is uh, like, I'm sorry, feeling remorseful and so on. So, and this psalm was sung on Yom Kippur Day. Now, you know Yom Kippur by now, right? It is the Day of Atonement, wherein once a year, once a year on that day, the High Priest of Israel will go into the Most Holy Place and he will seek the Lord's forgiveness, Jehovah's forgiveness for the people's sin for that year. That is Yom Kippur. That is the most holy day, holiest day uh, in the Jewish calendar. And so this Psalm 38 was read that, forgive my sin. So divided into three sections. Now I want to remind you of all these divisions that I give to you and sections that I give to you every week. Uh, these are not in the Bible, okay? These are not. Uh, these divisions are just uh, to help us to break down and to, to understand the different sections of the psalm. Easier for you to study, you understand? But don't go and uh, say, oh, this is uh, definitely uh, section one, and, uh, it's just to help us. So David's conviction and affliction, verses one to eight, then his lonely suffering, verses 9 to 14, and David's confident hope, verses 15 to 22. So, verse 1. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure, for your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. Now, it, it is quite evident that David was feeling the heat. You understand? No? He was feeling the heat of this chastisement, uh, punishment that was inflicted upon him. And it seems like it was coming from God. And as we shall read, God permitted this to happen to him. And we will know that this sickness was because of his sin. So he sought the Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, in your anger. Do not chasten me in your hot displeasure. And not only he felt, uh, un, I mean, uh, disease emotionally, he also felt disease uh, physically. For he said, your arrows pierce me deeply and your hand presses me down. As if God's hand was upon him, he felt it as if it was physical. Now when 
you say that the Lord's hand presses down on you. That is what we call conviction. You understand? No, no, no. I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, David continued to live and he said, until Nathan came along and told him the parable, they said, oh, that's you. Then he felt convicted, right? He said, I have sinned. So that is the moment when the Lord's hand presses down on him. And also it was a period of nine months before Nathan came. So from the time of his uh, sin, his commission of sin, adultery and so on, it was a long period of nine months before Nathan came. And so during this period, he was feeling the heat and the hand of God upon him. There was, there is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any help in my bones because of my sin. Because of my sin. Now, I, I want to say, not all instances of uh, ill health or infirmity is because of sin. This is just one instance. You remember, you remember the disciples asked Jesus, this man was born blind. Who sinned? He sinned, his parents sinned, or who sinned? And Jesus said what? Neither. This happened so that God be glorified. Because when Jesus healed him, God is glorified. Okay? So, we cannot make a general conclusion that all illnesses is because of sin. We, we studied Job, right? Job, God said he's a blameless, upright man. And he was inflicted with all this uh, things uh, on his body. Did he see? Yeah. So, but in this instance, we shall see because of David. But let's look at some scripture while we are here. Isaiah 32 verse 17. We just want to do a comparison. Isaiah 32 verse 17. If you do right, what shall be your reward? Isaiah 32 verse 17. The work of righteousness will be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Forever. Not only now, but in the future as well. Peace, quietness, and assurance. These are for the righteous. Okay, the other one, uh, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Now, you have peace. Huh? Doesn't mean... Everything is so nice, you know, just like you, you walk down on your road, this spirit of uh, wow, all the lights and Christmas, peace you know, on earth. And, but there is still evil going around. Yeah. Uh, there, there are still conflicts in this world. There are, there are still crimes committed in Singapore. But we have peace in God. You understand? We find peace in Him. So, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, what did Paul write? Therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through, through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been justified, having been justified, just as if you have not sinned. That's what justified means. Yeah. And having been justified, what do we have? Peace. Peace not with the world, not in the world, but peace with God. Through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. But the opposite is, if you sin, then there's likelihood of uh, some consequences. And one of them is illness, as in the case of David. Okay. So back to Psalm 38. For my iniquities have gone over my head. My iniquities have gone over my head. You know when you say, wow, all the troubles uh, are over my head. If you come, you come to office, uh, then you say, wow, all the work is over my head. That means what? Right, it's beyond your control. You can't manage, you understand? Uh, it's really beyond you. And that's what David was saying. My iniquities, not one, two wrong, have gone over me. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. Too heavy 
for even David to bear. So then what must you do? Give your burden to God. Jesus said, Come unto me, yeah, you weary and, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So pass your burden, pass your load to him. He will carry for you. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. Of course, breaking the laws, breaking the commandments, the, the, the five of the ten commandments in one afternoon, that was foolishness. But sometimes, uh, in the passion of sin, you just get so caught up, you understand? Yeah. And so he was. Because of my foolishness, my wounds are stink. If you read the King James, uh, uh, the, the word is stronger than not just foul, but stinking, stink, smelly, and festering. The King James word is corrupt. Corrupt. Okay. Verse 6, I am troubled and I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. So full. He was not well. Verse 7, for my loins are full of inflammation, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. So you see here, verse 7 and 8. In verse 7, he was crushed physically. In verse 8, he was crushed emotionally. And verse 7, Many scholars, commentators uh, suspect that it was a sexually transmitted disease. Okay? Because you got more than one wife, like right? concubine, whatever. Okay? And you read again, verse 7, For my loins are full of inflammation, and there is no soundness in my flesh. Well, we don't want to jump to conclusion. I'm just telling you what some commentators say. It could be, we don't know. It could be AIDS, it could be PD, it could be whatever, gonorrhea, we don't know. But he was unwell. Physically, he was crushed externally. Emotionally too, I'm feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. And I tell you, we often are crushed. We feel the crush emotionally more than physically. Physically, we can put makeup, you know, we can look good and so on. But when you are crushed emotionally, you know, that is more painful. And so he was. So the first eight verses, David's conviction and affliction. So now as we go on to the second part, he was suffering alone. Alone. Verses 9 to 14. So who did he turn to? Who else? God. Lord, all my desire is before you, and my sign is not hidden from you. My heart pants or pounds or pounding. My heart pants. My strength fails me. As for the light of my eyes, it has it also has gone from me. And this is a description of dying. Okay? Near death. When the light goes out, that means what? Tong tong tang. Okay. So he was saying, as the as for the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. About to go. That's what he was saying. And you know, weakness in your body usually is because of the heavy load you are carrying, the burden, the the, the, the sin that you are bearing. It weakens your character, it, it weakens your, your, your willpower, and so on. Okay? But mostly, it weakens your character. So, verse 11. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague, and my relatives stand afar off. A friend in need is a friend indeed. So, in times like this, his friends scrambled. They ran away. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my 
play. So the play is referring to source. So uh, some commented, I mean, some say sexually transmitted disease. Uh, so others said because of this source, uh, it could be leprosy. It could be leprosy. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I, I doubt leprosy. I, I believe it's more sexually transmitted disease. So you, you see the helplessness of David and his loneliness all deserted him. And so was our Lord Jesus. When he was arrested, where were the disciples? Yeah. Army said, take cover. Ciao. Okay. Verse 12. Those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. Verse 12, 12 talks about his enemies. And his enemies really uh, cherish this moment because this moment was David's moment of vulnerability. Because you know what? He is weak. He is unwell. And so they start to speak of how to destroy David. And how to deceive him. So these are your friends or enemies. When you are down, they step on you. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. And I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. That means he did not defend nor explain. I, like a deaf man, do not hear. So don't let all this... Uh, don't let all this uh, uh, discouragement and all these threats and so on come to your ears. Yeah. Even if they do choose to ignore them, sometimes it is not easy. We all have our fair share, right? We have naysayers, we have our critics, and they come and then they, they, they rain all these things upon you. And I have received my fair share, whether in the ministry or whether in my industry or whatever. Just choose to ignore them. I, like a deaf man, do not hear. But at the same time, David was also wise. No point rebuking them. You're wasting your breath on these people. But in any case, he was weak. And I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. Choose, he chose not to defend or explain his position. Thus, I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth is no response. And that was David's suffering alone. Now, when you are suffering, when you are down, you know what you need most? You need company. You need people to encourage you. That's why we, we make hospital visits and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, to encourage people. But if you go to some of those old folks home, or some, some, some children, uh, they, they just wash their hands of responsibility and then they just send the parents and so on to all this aged home. And you go and you look at the row of beds and so on. Actually, it's quite sad. If you talk to some of them, uh, they have not been visited for the longest time. And I've visited a couple of them before and kid got business, kid got this, you know, got work, but the mother is just there. And in her suffering, she is alone. It's quite sad. And it's happening, you know, in Singapore. So, that is, that was David's lonely suffering. Now we go on to the last section, which is David's confident hope. So in all this ordeal, who can he turn to but God? So, verse 15, For in you, O Lord, I hope. It means also, I wait for you, O Lord. You will hear, O Lord, my God. For I said, hear me, lest they rejoice over me, lest when my foot slips, they exalt themselves against me. 
In other words, we have sung this song before, Let not my enemies triumph over me. I can't remember the title, but you know this song, right? Let not my enemies triumph over me. Because when my foot slips, wow, they will be celebrating. They will, ex they will exalt themselves against me. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Second Corinthians 12 was recorded by Paul himself. And he, he wasn't having a bed of roses in lifestyle. He also had his suffering. He also had his discomfort. And he recorded this for us. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. You know, Paul received a lot of revelation. In fact, who was a major contributor to the New Testament? Paul. He wrote the most. And, and you know, the Holy Spirit downloaded into him so much. So, he got all the abundance of revelation, which you and I don't have. You know, we as survivor do only, but he got everything. So he should be what? Surfing on the clock, you understand? floating around, I should be exalted. But he was kept down to earth. Instead of just floating around feeling so spiritual, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Given to him. By whom? God allowed it. You understand? God allowed it. So that he is kept down to earth. Because some people feel, hey, you know, they go around speaking and preaching, uh, Name it and claim it. God will bless you. No, reject all this. Don't, uh, don't believe in all this. But the reality is we are still living in the fallen world. And so the thorn in the flesh was given to him. A messenger of Satan who buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. That means unless pride takes over me. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. First step. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in pursuit. In distresses, for what? For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak physically, then I am strong spiritually in Christ. You understand? That is what Paul was saying. But uh, was Paul not deserving of healing? Shouldn't be why? God's messenger, wonderful, great servant of God, Paul, yeah? missionary to the Gentiles. Was God not able to heal him? Of course, God is able to heal him. Was God not able to use him to heal others? Yes. God used him to heal others, right? Paul. Then why can't God use him to heal himself? But God has His reason. God has His purpose. And so as we have just read, so even David, in his infirmities, in his infirmities, yeah, he was going through all this, but he still turned to God and he trusted in God. Yeah. That God knows best. Verse 17, Psalm 38. For... I am ready to fall and my sorrow is continually before me. Pain, he was in pain. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. I will declare my iniquity. 
We all know this verse very well. 1 John 1 9. You know 1 John 1 9? Okay. So that one seems to be like an antidote. You know, you take poison, then you have antidote. So you commit a sin, quickly do antidote. Okay. Uh, but if you mean what you say, if you mean what you confess and you repent, God will forgive you. It is not an antidote. Okay? It is God's grace, His mercy. I will be in anguish over my sin, but my enemies are vigorous and, are, and they are strong. That means he got active enemies. And those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Those also who render evil for good, they are my adversaries because I follow what is good. Right? Because I follow what is good. And God is good. I follow Him. But there are many people who don't like what we do. Right? And that's why we have all this kind of uh, conflicts. They are my adversaries. Uh, the, the, this David said, because I follow what is good. So to God he said, do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. God, this is urgent. Hurry up. And we do pray that because when we are desperate. <coughs> jump cue, jump cue. Tend to me first. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So he was praying to God, as you can see. He kept turning to God and that was the most logical thing to do. Question. Does your prayer change God? Does your prayer change God? Or does your prayer change you? It changed me. It changed you. Yeah. God does not change. He is. But when we come to Him in humility, we come to Him in repentance and, and, and with a heavy uh, burden and, and we bring our things before Him, He actually changes us. So, we, we, we learn to wait on Him, we, we learn to be patient, we, we, we learn about the beauty of His uh, holiness, of His grace upon us. He changes us. He transforms us. But some people, the way they pray is, God, you change. No, God will not change. Prayer will change you and I. Amen.